Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Game Gear Max live broadcast number 93. And before I say another syllable, I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me loud and proud. Sue, I have a screen, I have many screens, one of them you can't see. And on that screen I can see the live chat. Because we're live people. People who are joining us live get to chat and get to chat live. And I'm so, <laughs> I'm asking if anyone can hear me. Usually people say, yes, we can hear you before I even ask the question. Thank you very much, Monkey Frog Studio. You can all hear me. That is great. I can move on to the first thing. What is the first thing? Well, I'd like to tell you something about Game Guru Max broadcast because it's split into two parts. We have um, a demo part and then a questions and answers part. Now, the questions and answers part is basically just a big sheet of questions, and I answer those uh, questions verbally uh, until we run out of time. But it's not the most exciting thing, so we start things off with the demo part. That's where I get to show you the software that I'm going to launch right now. And in this demonstration, you get to see something you've probably not seen before in any of the broadcasts. So I'm just going to go straight into my empty level. Not too exciting right now, but I assure you it does get better. And I do have a point for giving you such an empty level. The reason I emphasise this empty level is that most of the time in the demo part of our broadcast, I show you like an entire game uh, demo game project that a third party, a community member, has created. And I get to have a lot of fun romping through that demo to show you what's been created. Uh, we have demos um, on the wings, bubbling away, ready for future broadcasts. But this week, there was um, a feature edition. I know we're fixing bugs, and we are fixing a lot of bugs. But there was a feature edition so impressive, I thought we can dedicate a whole broadcast to it. It won't take long, but I just need to show you that it exists in the current build and how you can make the most out of it. And that is something called SSAO. Now, for anyone <laughs> who's been privileged to watch previous broadcasts, you might have heard me mention, we have no plans to add SSAO, maybe when we do a future uh, merge with the latest version of the Wicked Engine. And then one of my team members just snuck it in. <laughs> just, well, I've added it, so what's the point? And it's amazing. It, and it was worth doing. I absolutely am fine with the fact it snuck in from the side because uh, I'd like to demonstrate it and I think you'll agree it was the missing ingredient between some screenshots that you compared say with Game Guru Classic and Game Guru Max you think well oh, it looks the same as Classic SSAO done well <laughs> completely splits those two comparisons in half so I think that's enough waffle uh, from me but before I get to show you that really cool eye candy because I think it'd be nice to finish on a nice piece of eye, eye candy. So what I'm going to start with is less eye candy, but more really cool for those advanced slash developer mode users who want perfection. Because uh, it was just completed today. It will be part of this Friday's update. So if this is something that interests you, then check this out on Friday. What is it? Well, anyone who's observant will already have noticed what's going on. Notice I've not selected an object yet. But we now have grid and alignment settings. See, it's actually appearing here outside of object selection. Because it makes sense. Grid and alignment settings should not be dependent on the selection of an object. You should be able to set your stage, configure your scene for your grid alignment stuff before you drag in a single object. And so that's what we've done. We've made a decision. We've put it in at this level. And anyone who's not familiar with grid and alignment and what is all that about, think of it this way. An artist has created a lot of objects for your scene. And they've made them all 100 by 100 by 100. Which means you could click them together like pieces of Lego brick and they'll line up perfectly. Well, Game Bureau Max changed that up so you could choose the size of your grid. So the grid could be 50 by 50 by 100, or 25 by 25 by 10. The grid's up to you, you can choose that. 
Then we went a stage further, well we didn't, a community member did, and said, wait a minute, this doesn't work like other art packages. Blender, for example, you can choose not just the size of your grid, but the offset of your grid. Where does the grid start? Can I shift the grid? And the, the, the offset that we selected was dependent on the grid size, which meant you centred your objects on the grid tile centre. Now, I know I'm going off on a massive tech tangent, but I think it'll all make sense when I demonstrate it. So, I've dropped down a tile here, and I dropped down this one. As you can see, there is no grid going on. It's just, you can move these objects around as you see fit. Now, watch what happens when I select grid mode. See, it's grid mode positions, and you get this. Normally, the last Friday build, you only saw two of these, which was grid the grid size. Now we've actually added two more parameters, offset and grid size. Now if I click this, it's now aligning to some invisible grid you can't see. This one as well and this one as well. If I drop the fourth one in, like so. And as you can see what a grid does, it doesn't move it every pixel, it, it aligns it to this grid system. And the grid at the moment is 100 by 100, it's offset 50-50. Now if I set them to 0, 0, can you imagine what's going to happen? Yeah. It offsets it to this new grid because you've shifted the whole grid uh, so it's not offset by 50-50. The reason it defaults to 50-50, just for those who are interested, is that's how it used to be before today. Last Friday's build, this was the configuration. And a grid offset of 50-50 and a grid size of 100-100. Why have we maintained these? Why is it not 0-0? Well, it's because if you've already created a level, that depended on this fixed initial grid, and you then started to use this feature, it would move literally anything that you've placed down on your 100-100 grid. And that, again, was reported to us by the community, and it was clearly unacceptable. So now, by default, you're going to get what you had before. But now you've got the configuration to be able to change both the grid offset and the grid size. Now, I won't go into too many details because I think it's still under development, uh, but what you'll find is in the in the in the weeks and months to come this will really come into its own can you imagine having a whole set of scenery elements that can click nicely together based on a grid snaps pretty cool snap mode actually reads the dimensions of an individual object and clicks like-minded well the same object type together in 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 perfectness but it has to be the same object Two similar objects of the same dimension won't use the snap mode. It won't recognize it can snap to it. But the grid position can, and that's what you get in here. Now, the reason I mention this is even though we're doing this massive push, every single team member is now literally obsessed with fixing bugs as quickly as possible and getting our bugs issues list right down. But every now and again, something comes through that initially was registered as a bug. We could argue it was a feature, but it actually sit, sat in that sweet spot where we think, yeah, you could technically argue it's a feature request, but really, if every other 3D modeler and anyone who's creating their own custom art and wants to get it into their level and, and, and lay it out, and they all need this, not an optional, you absolutely need it if you're going to carry on, we figured that's worth going in as part of our many myriad uh, bug fixes. So I'm sorry I took too long. I'm really proud with this system. It now works for any offset, any grid, and wherever you grab it. You notice when I grab it there and it switches across that boundary, and if I grab it here, a different part, it does the same. We've accounted for wherever you grab it, it doesn't matter. You, when your mouse pointer crosses the threshold, it switches to that new grid position. It took me quite a while to actually get it under all scenarios, but I'm pretty happy with it now, and I hope you are too. Come on, uh, come the Friday release. But that ain't what I want to show you. I digress. What I want to show you is building, which you've seen before. I'm still using the grid system, just get rid of that. What I want to show you is this. If I jump into the building, and then... Da -da 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 -da, what do you think? What do you think of this screenshot right now? Nice. No. You, this is practically indistinguishable from a graphic you might have seen, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago. Or maybe more specifically, a screenshot you might have seen in Game Guru Classic. And the reason why? Well, a couple of reasons. One, if we come outside a little bit, um, there's the shadow. 
See the shadow there, that, that dark bit, and then the light shadow. If we come round here, the shadow's being cast. So inside here, it's all shadow. Look, we're outside the shadow, we get a bit of sunlight, and soon we cross that threshold. It's all in shadow. Now, here's the thing with PBR. Unless you've got a light source, you know, a projection of light that can then cast shadows or influence metallicness or, or all the other elements that make PBR work. If you're entirely in shadow, there's nothing much PBR can do. But let me show you a thing. It's a thing called screen space ambient occlusion. It's something that I said we don't support. But now we do, thanks to one of our teammates. So if I go to post processing, and post processing, you might not see it in standard user, just go to your edit settings and you can activate post processing as an advanced feature. Look what happens when I enable the, so it's just called AO. It should really be called uh, screen space AO, um, but this particular technique is something called MSAO. So there's a lot of acronyms to fight through. Just think of it as ambient occlusion done in real time. And uh, for my computer, it takes about 0.3 milliseconds, which is basically free. But let me just switch backwards and forwards just in case you missed what was happening. In this scenario, with AO switched off, screen space ambient switched off, Everything's matte. Everything's basically the albedo texture and there's light can't get in. The light's being blocked by that roof over there. So all you get in is here. But I could add light in here. Let's say I add this light. Great, we got light and everything starts to spring to life. But without that light, it's very matte. However, if you actually selected your screen space ambient occlusion, it looks instantaneously better. Don't worry about this little artifact. We're going to be working on that separately. That's a separate issue. But look what's already happened. It's created these shadows. Where did these shadows come from? Well, the real time. It's taking the, um, the almost the final render of your scene and the depth buffer of your final scene and figuring out where the creases are. Where will light likely not end up? Now, if you did it properly, it would still be a super expensive technique because so you'd have to sample so many pixels in the vicinity. For every pixel, you'd sample like hundreds of other pixels to see how dark it was. But there's some very clever techniques and it's those clever techniques that allow us to have the performance, but have some level of the realism of these creases and these dark areas. And uh, we are going to be going through every single demo to make sure that the lighting conditions are correct to exaggerate this idea of screen space ambient occlusion when you don't have a light to help you. And what I mean by that is if I dropped in a light right there, did you notice what happened? It completely eliminated the screen space ambient occlusion because then here's the golden rule, screen space ambient occlusion only operates on ambient color, it does not operate on direct light. Direct light has quite enough going on so you can rely on that to cast your shadows and to fill the surfaces with the light of your color of choice but when you remove it and you have no lights to choose from you still have this backup now of the screen space ambient occlusion which looks really nice so that's basically one of my tips if you're going to play around with this and enable it you have to make sure if i go to um custom skies this one here see this ambient color that determines how much of this screen space ambient occlusion is applied to your final C scene because it can only do what's called a modulation on the ambient color if your ambient color was black this couldn't do anything and the brighter your ambient color is the more effect this can do I'm not saying it's super perfect there's a couple of artifacts that is inherent with screen space ambient occlusion that's calculated almost right at the end. Most modern games, or at least certainly the last 10 years, ambient occlusion was a pre-baked term. It would be calculated way early in the process and those light maps, as they were called, would be loaded in to give you this sort of effect. As you've probably figured out by now, Game Guru Max want to strive for real-time lighting effects, real-time effects. Effects that when you move an object or a light or a thing or an effect Everything in the scene will respect that change and that change can happen in your game in real time So that's what I wanted to talk about. It's a screen space ambient occlusion term But we're using the specifically the MSAO 
and I tried to Google it. It's very hard to find out what the acronym stands for, but the closest I could find out is it's screen space ambient occlusion, but it was pioneered by Microsoft, and Microsoft put their M at the start of it to distinguish it from regular old SSAO. And your mileage really does vary with SSAO. And to that end, if we go to post-processing, we have given you one slider. The only slider, now just to let you know as well, this screen space ambient occlusion term, we didn't pioneer and create it and made it lovely. It was in the Wicked engine. Remember, we sit on top of the Wicked graphics engine and it was sitting there ready to be used. As indeed, there are many other features sitting in the Wicked engine ready to be used. And this is one that was exposed. It has multiple settings, but this was the one that we felt give you some control. There was other settings, but it never seemed to do anything. So you get to control how aggressive this AO influence is on your ambient colour. If it was zero, or it was that, I think it was, what is it now? Zero to eight, right. So we thought that was a decent scale. It allows you to choose and tweak. And what you'll find is whatever level you create and you put your lights in and you're running around and then you go into a room where there's no lights and you think, oh, this looks rather matte. Activate AO, set your power, get it just right so you get the shadows, the darkness that you want. Or maybe you want a bright scene with just a little cue as to these creases. Then you get control over it here. So we're calling it MSA. Um, oh, sorry, calling it AO because uh, you won't find many references to MSAO right now. But if you look for SSAO, just look for the AO, which is sitting here in the post processing component, which you can activate if you go to advanced and click this one here, the post processing tick box. Um, <clears throat> should I talk about shadows? Yeah, okay. Is a five second blurb on shadows. When you design your level and you cram a lot of dynamic lights in close proximity, you run your test game and you see a lot of flickering, it's because there's a value here which is limiting the amount of dynamic lights that can cast shadows. And you might find this is set to four or eight. Um, and if you're using a lot of lights in close proximity, just bump it up to 12 or 16 and all that flickering will go away. We are looking at a solution which is more elegant which means you'll, because it, it kind of looks like a bug when it flickers, it's not. It's just you're limiting the amount of lights that can cast shadows. We do have some ideas how you can select basically anything you want. There will be no flickering. The only distinction is some lights will be casting low resolution shadows and other ones might, I urge the word might, be casting high resolution shadows. That way you don't get what looks like a bug, but you still get to control what ultimately boils down to performance. Because if you try and create too many point lights with large um, shadow resolutions and you only have, say, two or four gigabytes of video memory, you get what's called thrashing, where it has to unload video memory into system memory and retrieve system memory and put it in video memory and it slows your FPS right down. So that's one of our internal objectives, to make sure that's nice and smooth, slick and smooth, no matter what it is that you select here. So just checking out the clock, I have done a good deal of rambling. I try and kind of keep it to about 12 minutes. I've just bombed on and done 22 minutes. Does that mean we don't have as much time for questions? Probably. <laughs> I don't think, I'm going to be here all day. Um, but fortunately, we have been joined by Zach, who hopefully has been answering a couple of questions in my absence. I'm now going to scour our live chat, this is what it looks like, our live chat. And I would ask uh, Zach if there's any questions that you couldn't answer to start posting them. And I'm going to start at the end. Reason is, if some questions have already been answered, then I don't want to repeat the answer. Or worse, provide a different answer. So it starts here, and I'm going to look for the first question mark going up the live chat that takes my eye. And I'm afraid that is from Zorgo33. And your question is, a feature to make zooms infinite. For example, story zone that executes anywhere for a more stable cutscene trigger at start or an infinite image zone that is always on screen. You could argue a zone that's infinite isn't a zone. It's your level. <laughs> but I think I know what you mean. And the answer is we are going to, or at least it's in planning stage, but I think it's a great idea, to expand the capabilities of your traditional game element zone. 
So instead of it just being within this contour, it could be within the distance of the center of that zone. So for that particular use scenario, you just drop in a zone, arbitrarily anywhere, anywhere near the start marker, and then ramp up the range. So you don't use a zone contour, you use a range from the center of this zone, and then you get to trigger your video or whatever it is else you want to do. So we already have that on our roadmap, we're thinking about it. And uh, look forward to a feature, uh, sorry, a functionality related to that very soon. Oh, and uh, Game Guru Official, I don't know who that is. <laughs> Another of our many uh, magnificent team members are answering some questions. So I'm going like, to find another question. Hopefully that has already been answered. Uh, thanks, Zach. This is one from earlier, I think. Are there plans to add more controls for MSA, or such as bias, thickness of the effects in the corners? Wicked Graphics Engine, on which we sit, does expose additional settings, but I've been assured by Paul a uh, top graphics guy, that when he changed those settings and turned them to zero or a thousand, not much changed, or if they did change, they messed everything up. So we are, at the moment, we're going to be bound by what the shader slash wiki graphics engine exposes. But if there's something very specific, or even better, that you found like a buyer setting that you find useful in the Wicked engine, yes, we can absolutely expose that. So do let us know if you found it and even point to the source code. Makes our job a little bit easier and gets you that feature all the sooner. <clears throat> Look for the next question mark. Um, I think, can I change? That sounds like a question. For future reference, everyone, if you could put a question mark in, because that's kind of what I'm looking for, just to skim through the live chat super quick. This is from Games Ambassador. Can I change the sound of the player walking or the sound of the player when he takes things? You can change the sound of uh, when someone picks something up. Yeah, that's available as uh, when you select the uh, collectible, the, the, the pick up behavior, you can choose the sound effect for that. The player walking is based on materials. At the moment those are fixed, we have about 32 material slots. We've populated many of them for stone, metal, wood, grass, etc. But yes, there are requests for customizing terrain textures, terrain sounds, everything in between there should be nothing that can't be customized that's basically the the request that we've got we've got so far from the community and i completely agree so as for right now no just choose a material that's closely matches what you've created but down the road if you want the sound of gelatinous plasma on planet zod <laughs> and there's no such material that we have provided and you want to provide your own yeah that's certainly part of the future plan is this a question? It is a question. It's from 3Com. Any thought about emissive improvement? Yes, I actually did quite a bit of work because there's some really passionate community members who want it absolutely right. My latest researches are that if you power up an emissive colour, eventually it saturates all the channels. So if you've got that RGB of, say, 10, 20, 30, and then you multiply all those values by a gazillion they all become white. 255, 255, 255. You multiply them enough, they all become white. And that's not really what you want. It works great if you keep one of the channels at zero, because then you can multiply zero all you like, it will always stay zero. So you can have primary and secondary colours as blooming brilliant as you want. But always, that's not always what you want. Sometimes you want subtlety in your colouring. And so what I'd concluded, it's not necessarily the emissive problem, it's how much the bloom can carry that emissive colour out to create a nice aura around that emissiveness. Emissiveness, you think, you know, it's about how magnificent it is on the screen, but actually it's not just about the emissiveness, it's the bloom that carries that colour out into the rest of your scene. And at the moment, I'm underwhelmed with the current bloom system. I think we can improve that. So the goal is, at least in my mind, is that we can let you choose any emissive colour, but then we improve the bloom system so you can carry that colour to whatever degree that you want. And that's the improvement that's going on in my mind right now. And there already is a GitHub issues uh, board item that discusses that quite extensively. So if you are interested in emissive, please join that discussion. And between us all, we can figure out the perfect 
um, killer set of functionality so you get everything that you want and none of the things that you don't want. Looks like I've scrolled so far beyond I may have missed the next question in order so I'm scrolling up a little bit. <coughs> Thanks Games Ambassador <laughs> for adding the question mark obviously in a different line. This is another one that was asked earlier from Zach Zudges. Will there be a tutorial on creating and adding character models and clothes items with a custom skeleton from Mixamo, for example? There definitely will be a tutorial. In fact, there will be a guide which describes the technical hurdles you'd have to go through to do all of this. And of course, some templates, some files that we'll provide just to get you started quickly. And quite recently, I've been looking at the uh, the Mixamo, uh, Mixamo Sorry, mix some more exports of animation only um, models. So that would be, say, for example, FBX files that contain animation but no base rig and no model. And, uh, and a mix some more exports that is all the model and none of the animations. And how do we make all that work together? I think we realized quite a long time ago a character creator plus is cool. I mean, create characters just without having any modeling experience. But there will be quite a tonnage of characters from the outside world, third party characters that were created that not only do you want to import them and have them at the right size and scale and rendered on the PBR, but you want to give them the animations that you have in mind. I mean, we'll leave it up to you to match the rigs of the base model and the animations, but Mixamo is a perfect example. It gives you the model and then it gives you the animations with the same rig and you should be able to apply those animations when you import a model and add animations to it. So we're already looking at it. It's something we feel it's important. So you're not just relying on the character creator. But you can bring in not just static models, but your own characters into Game Guru Match. So watch your space on that. Um, Zorgo33 asks, how much does AO impact performance? Is it demanding or not? Uh, your mileage may vary. My computer runs on a, a GTX 1080, and I can do it up the whole scene in 0.3. Uh, milliseconds on a um, 1920 by 1080p resolution. Nowhere near 4K, where obviously the performance um, would decrease on my card. But I'm quite happy with 1080p, and I'm doing it in 0.3 of a millisecond. Compared that to a lot of the other tasks that the GPU has to do, it's relatively minor. It's a relatively minor cost. And I can tell you the first example of a screen space ambient occlusion goes all the way back to 2007. 2007! Uh, part of the Crytek technology. So it's fine. It isn't some newfangled ray casting trick where it kills your graphics performance. It's relatively cheap and quick. There's some artifacts, but generally it does improve your scenes. And if you're privy to our Discord channel, go check out some screenshots that I posted there, um, which I thought was pretty stark. It, it shows that there is a place in this world, certainly a place in Game Guru Max for SSAO, which is the acronym for Screen Space Ambient Occlusion. So the next question, this is from Monkey Frog Studios. The six, seven, eight, nine question marks. Ten question marks. No, nine question marks. Can we get an area light added along with the point and spotlights that are already there? No. Wow, Lee, that's a bit brutal. Reason? Uh, the Wicked Graphics Engine removed area lights. Now don't ask me why, but they wouldn't have removed it lightly. They removed it for a very good reason. I don't know what that reason is. If you did want area lights, just drop in a couple of point lights, or even better, because it's more spurring on shadow resolution, texture, memory, add in a series of spotlights facing downwards. So think of a strip light, you know, a long halogen strip light in a corridor. Maybe one, two, three spotlights spread out, one in the middle, one in the end, one on the other end pointing down. It's a good approximation of area lights because you get a lot of uh, shadow crossover which means soft shadows and it looks really nice and it's very performant and it's a very clever way to do it. Area lights, again I don't know why it was removed, I assume it was expensive and it doesn't work with all the different rendering schema. That's all I, that's my guess. But there's no plan to add area lights into Game Guru Max anytime soon. Now I'm checking the clock, we've gone over the 30 minute threshold which is, is always my little 
not Lee on the head. You've been talking far too long. But as is my custom, I apologise. I'm sure there's a gazillion more questions. But I'll just answer two more um, from people who haven't got to ask a question so far. And then I'm afraid you're going to have to remember your questions. You can ask them next Wednesday when we do the next live broadcast. So who gets to ask a question? Who hasn't asked a question before? And if I can't find any unique users, then I'll go back to the top set again. Looks like we do have a question from someone who's asked, not asked one yet. This is from Jareth. Is there anything being done to improve FPS? I've been discussing this a lot on the Discord. And with a system I have being limited to 80 to 90 FPS, depending on the map, is while limited to 80 frames per second... <laughs> wow, you must have an insanely cool system to reject 90 frames per second. Um, yes, we are continuing to improve the speed all the time. Reason? You probably already guessed this, but we're working on virtual reality. We're going to bring virtual reality to you. And we can't be lazy when it comes to what we do in the graphics engine side. Think about it. All we're going to do right now is render one scene and get a good frame rate. In VR, we have to render two scenes. Two almost identical scenes rendered side by side. And the only difference is the distance between your eyeballs. But we still have to render both scenes at the same time, or for the same frame. So we are working on speed optimizations, if nothing else but to give you a great VR experience. As a byproduct, if you're not interested in VR, you get a super fast series of improvements on single player, sorry, non-stereoscopic gameplay. <laughs> so yeah, we are working on it, fear not. And the last question is, is a question, another new, user asking the first question at least as far as i can see and this is from pan gangowski minecraft plug question will there be some kind of sequences example after triggering get light turns on after two seconds same players and after five seconds text on screen appears great question what you've literally described is something that already exists in the software and it's called the behavior editor not many people get to see it because it's hidden in the developer mode section but what it basically is, it allows you to chain logic together in order to create the sequence you've described. You could create right now. Um, should I show you? Well, we are here, aren't we? If I go to settings, developer mode settings, and then you activate one of these things down here. I'm sorry, I'm not too... Maybe it's already switched on. Here it is. Display AI management in test level. Yeah, I think on this one as well, switch that one on. And uh, if I then run the game, I know I'm really going off script here, so I probably... Oh, i tell you what, screen space anti-occlusion. <laughs> you got to love it. It's here. AI management, edit behaviours. If you select that, you can actually pick um, one of your objects that you've dropped into the, into, to the game with one of its starter behaviours, and then you can edit the logic of those behaviours. What do I mean by that? Well, it's exactly what you've just described. Have it play a sound, play an animation, wait for two seconds, wait until the player is in sight, wait till something else happens, wait till that happens. Right now, I think I've got about 92 conditions and about 60 actions. And these are little logic blocks that you can chain together. Just click one after the other. Now, the reason it's hidden in developer mode is it's very much programmer art. It's for those who kind of already know about logic and how to chain together and actions and conditions. Um, conditions and actions, sorry. But we felt having completed it, it's like, all right, it's all right to create our own behaviors, but I think standard users are going to struggle. So we are looking at a way to simplify it, make it easier to use, make it more robust, maybe put a bit of debugging in. But the bottom line is at some point down the road, that is going to be exposed to more people. And yes, you'll be able to start a new logic, trigger basic conditions, switch a light on, wait two seconds, play a sound, and then do something else. And you'll be able to do it just by dragging and clicking blocks together. And then you've got to press run and see those instructions being actioned one after the other in a very visual way. So that's definitely part of the roadmap that we see. Because it's all right dropping things into a level, but the next level of that when you're making a game 
It's chaining logic together, a sequence of actions that create narrative, that create interest, that create gameplay no one else has created because it's your chain of logic that you've originated out of your imagination. So what a great question to end on, and I'm pretty happy with the answer. <laughs> so look forward to watch this space, what's going to happen in the near future. So thanks very much for all your uh, questions. I'm sorry we didn't um, have enough time to answer them all, but we are 40 minutes in, and I think there is a golden rule. Do not let your broadcast last more than an hour late. <laughs> on pain of death. So thanks very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this little reveal. If you didn't know about Screen Space Ambient Occlusion, you definitely do now. And if you're interested in Game Guru Max and you want to learn more, please join me again next Wednesday at 7pm GMT. And in the meantime, my team will be cracking on with the next series of bug fixes and we look forward to revealing those not only on Friday, but many, many Fridays to follow. So until then, thank you very much for listening, and I shall speak to you all next week. Bye.